uh, practical theology. I do a lot with youth ministry. I know I see some of my students here. I apologize. You not only have to hear me during the week, but now you have to hear me on a Sunday. Uh, But it's really good to be with you this morning and opening God's Word. We are going to be reading from Acts chapter 6. And I'll be reading through verse 7. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning our text picks up right when the early church is starting to grow. And if you know the book of Acts, you read from the very beginning about how Jesus ascends into heaven and the disciples gather together and then the Holy Spirit is poured out and the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. The wind, the breath, the Spirit of God comes in and fills their lungs like Adam in Genesis 2 who is formed from the dust and God breathes into them the breath of life. So too the disciples, the wind, the breath, the Spirit fills them and pushes them out into the world where they speak in different languages and bear witness of the power of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And if you know the book of Acts, you know that Peter then gives a long sermon in chapter 2 and he calls people to repent and be baptized and it says at the very end, 3,000 persons were added and that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. It also goes on to say that they took care of each other, selling their possessions. They cared for those who had needs. So the early community is worshiping together. They're eating together. They're caring for one another. And the community grew. In chapter 4, the community challenges what Paul refers to as the principalities and powers of the world, the religious leaders, and eventually you'll see in the book of Acts how Paul is standing before the political leaders, all of these forces at work in the world. Peter and John go to the temple and they heal the man who is sitting outside, and this man becomes a sign of their authority, a sign that they're now the ones who speak for God, and they're invading the religious turf of the religious leaders, and they're bearing witness to the Lord, to the crucified and risen Christ. And if you know the book of Acts, you know that in chapter 4 they stand before the Sanhedrin and they're instructed, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they respond by saying that they're going to obey God, that nothing is going to stop them from speaking, from preaching. And again and again in the early chapters of Acts, we see that the community is growing This is the narrative context for our passage this morning. The Spirit creates a new people who testify to God's saving action and mercy. The community grows, and really, literally, if you think about Pentecost, they are on fire. They worship, they eat, they care for one another, and they build a community grounded in the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. But everything is not okay. Chapter 5 brings discord. The story of Ananias and Sapphira shows the cracks are beginning to form. And in chapter 6, we see the result of this rapid growth. People are being neglected. The Hellenists complain that their widows are not receiving the food that they need. Now this morning, I want to suggest this. I believe that Acts 6 is really a story about how the Holy Spirit confronts the powers of this age. You see, the New Testament authors are always proclaiming the gospel in the context of an ancient cultural system that names people and divides people. 
It's a culture that is built upon hierarchy of those who are insiders and those who are outsiders. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. Paul talks about this in Galatians, and he talks about it in Colossians. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, In that renewal there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. What Paul is saying to the Colossian community is that these cultural markers that determined a person's place in society, that really determined who ate with one another, who worked with one another, one's state or place in the world, these things no longer apply. What I love about the, the Colossian text, and this is why I use it, is that even the dreaded Scythians, the barbarians at the edge of civilization, they're no longer outsiders. You see, in Christ, every cultural category, every label is weakened. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither Hebrew nor Hellenist. And yet, here in chapter 6, these labels are very present. Showing how from the very beginning, the church has struggled to overcome the ideological powers that divide us. How from the very beginning, the church has always struggled with these powers that want to privilege one group of people over another. The Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected. The disciples come on the scene and they address the problem head on and they tell the community to choose seven people to care for the widows. And here we would say they establish the first group of deacons. And all of the names there, I had to practice them multiple times here this morning so I didn't, didn't butcher them, they're Hellenistic. In other words, it's the Hellenistic widows who are not being fed. So the disciples commission a group of Hellenistic people to meet these needs. And here we see that the Holy Spirit is at work, breaking down barriers in the Christian community, empowering those on the margins to care for one another. But this morning, I think we should not let the disciples' words just kind of slip by without comment. It is not right that we should neglect the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, some of the commentaries, if you read them, will, will say, well, you know, really the disciples here are not trying to create a distinction between the work of waiting tables and, and uh, preaching the word. They're just really saying that their work is evangelism, that their task is to preach the word. But this morning, I am not ready to let the disciples off the hook. Because again, I think the tendency within the Christian community has always been to divide the tendency in the Christian community has always been to try to create a hierarchy. To say, well, we don't really need to deal with this. Let's let somebody else do it. And I don't know about your church, but usually that means we start a new committee. And then we commission them to go and do the work. But the message for us this morning is that the power of the Holy Spirit has been unleashed and when the power of the Holy Spirit is unleashed, it will not be contained. This morning, the disciples distinguish between the preaching of the word and the waiting of tables. The seven will take care of the widows. Yet, read through chapter 7 sometime. What do we find? Who is it that is out on the corner teaching and preaching? It is Stephen. Stephen is one of the seven who is supposed to be waiting on tables, metaphorically, but who is out now proclaiming the gospel. You see, we like to make our nice, neat little categories, but the Holy Spirit, when it is unleashed, is no respecter of our labels or our divisions. Because the Holy Spirit has come to bring life and the Holy Spirit has come to unleash the power of God. A different way of saying it is that the Holy Spirit has come to make a holy mess of things, to transgress our tidy categories and to transgress our strategic plans. 
And it's important, I think, here this morning that we recognize something else. Some of you might say, why did you have to start like all the way back in Acts 1 and move and just start at chapter 6? That's our text. But it's important that we recognize this, that all of the worship that we do, all of the doctrine and theological teaching, all of the preaching and all the evangelism is really of no use if real flesh and blood people are being neglected. It's really of no use if the widows aren't able to get their food. What good is it all, all of this, if we can't love our neighbor? Jesus summarized the law, and you know this, by saying that the new community is defined by love. What is the greatest commandment? Love God and love your neighbor. And love is always pushing us outward to the fringes. Love is always pushing us back out to the widows, whoever they might be. Love is always pushing us out to our concrete neighbors, to the outsiders, to those who are made invisible by every cultural label or ideology. Our doctrines, our theology, our liturgy, as important as they might be, it's all a waste of time if we are unable or maybe even unwilling to love and care for our neighbor. The vertical and the horizontal are always connected. This is what 1 John 4 says. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. You see, the Christian community, 2,000 years later, we still struggle with all of this stuff. We still struggle with cultural labels that create hostility and division. Labels like conservative and liberal, Republican and Democrat right now are dividing the Christian community, and they're fostering hostility and hatred. And this morning, it's important to say that both sides are to blame, because both sides refuse to listen, to practice empathy, to truly seek ways to know and love their brothers and sisters. Today, labels like illegal and undocumented are also creating divisions within our community. Fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus, whether they're Roman Catholic or Pentecostal or somewhere in between, are flocking to our southern border. And they're making their way up into our communities to find work, to find safety from violence. And yet when they come, they find themselves caught up in new cultural and political struggles. A few weeks ago, I spent some time in Tijuana with a group of fellow members of the Office of Social Justice in the Christian Reformed Church. We spent a lot of time talking about the issues related to immigration. We visited a local church that helps migrants seek asylum. We talked to the people who minister to the groups that are coming and living on the streets or those who are living in the large drainage uh, drainage ditch that runs straight through the middle of the city. It was a very, very powerful experience to hear the stories of people who have been deported, to hear the stories of people who have left Honduras and are on their way to the United States seeking asylum. But I have to tell you this morning, it was also difficult for an entirely different reason. One of my colleagues in the Office of Social Justice whom I work with is a young Latina woman from California. And as we spent time together and as the weekend progressed, she became very comfortable with me. So comfortable that she took it upon herself to confront me. She challenged me. She got in my face. And she challenged me to think about my own privilege She challenged me to think about what it's like to be a white male living in a cultural system that benefits me in the ways that it doesn't benefit anybody else. Now I have to tell you, I listened to her and for a while I uh, nodded my head and I agreed, but as, as her words became a little bit deeper and cut a little bit deeper, challenged me a little bit deeper, I began to argue with her. And this continued on and on and on, and some of the things she said enraged me. 
we were sitting at a pub and we were having this conversation and pretty soon our voices are raised and you can see all of the people kind of looking at us trying to think what in the world is going on here I became very defensive and she said this to me she explained to me that often the most difficult experience the most difficult people that she has to deal with on these immersion trips when she takes people into Tijuana it's not the conservatives it's the white progressives she said, you white progressives, you think you got it all figured out. You think you know exactly what you're doing. You point to your actions and you point to your involvement here or there that you try to show that you're not racist and yet you are unable to see the privilege that insulates you from truly experiencing the suffering of others. The thing she kept saying to me over and over is this, Who's the hero in your story? Who's the protagonist? Who gets to make all of the decisions? See, this morning, the book of Acts confronts us with the exact same questions, doesn't it? Who's the protagonist in the story? Who gets to make all of the decisions? In Acts 6, we see how the Holy Spirit refuses to be limited by cultural labels. We see how the Spirit refuses to respect the distinctions even that are made by the disciples. And I have to tell you what this young woman was confronting me with is scary because power sharing is risky. Things will not stay the same. They can't stay the same. The Spirit forces us to move beyond our labels and our categories. To move beyond our denominational and doctrinal categories as important as they might be to move beyond our political and ideological categories and to step out in love. And in doing so, we enter into the suffering of others, empowering others to testify to the work of the gospel that is going on all around us, and often it is work that we cannot even see. I work very part-time for the Office of Social Justice in the Christian Reformed Church and the Evangelical Immigration Table. And just this last week, I met with a group of Latina women. And I listened. And then I remember saying to them, finally, it's like, well, what do I do? I'm a white male, and I'm doing this work. Do I still get to do this work? Should I quit doing this work? And their words to me was, just, it's not about abandoning the work. But it is about finding ways to use our privilege to give others a platform. So this morning, I want to introduce you to a very good friend of mine, Alex Vasquez. He's doing ministry that maybe some of you even have no idea is going on, and it might even be that for some of you, you don't even think this ministry might not even be necessary, not because we're bad people, but because we just can't see. So I want to give Alex a few minutes to come up and talk about the ministry that he is involved in in Sioux County and Sioux Center and in Orange City. Welcome, Alex. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jason. Thank you guys for allowing me to have an opportunity to share my story. Um, Jason was actually my freshman professor at Dort uh, University now. And I remember coming to Dort, and it was a struggle for me. I am from another world, coming to the middle of nowhere, Iowa, right, is what I, th what I would call it. And I remember Jason made me feel at home. There was questions I had where people looked at me funny, and they were like, why are you asking that? And Jason said, ask that question, and don't be discouraged, because I want to hear it, and I want to walk alongside you. Before I talk about a little bit of... What I felt God placed in my heart, I want to share a little bit of my story. I was born in the country of Colombia, South America, and my family uh, was struggling in Colombia financially, but then also there was a lot of violence going on in the country of Colombia. My cousin got kidnapped, 
And that was the final straw for my family. They said, you know what, we're moving to the United States. We're going to seek a better future for our family. So we moved to the United States, a better future, the American dream. That's what we were striving. But when we got here, it was not the American dream. We grew up poor. We didn't have a bed to sleep on. We had blankets and a little apartment that we lived in. And that's where we slept. Growing up, my mom was a Catholic, and my dad decided when we first got to the United States that he wanted to baptize us into the Mormon church. Reasoning why is that when we came in here, we were poor, the Mormon church came and helped us with food, gave us uh, a bed finally, they gave us a lot of things, and we were like, okay, if this is God, we're going to go follow him, right? So I grew up somewhat confused, right? I had a little bit of everything inside of me. I also grew up with a speech impediment. I really didn't know how to speak Spanish because the words wouldn't come out. But I didn't know the language of English, so I really didn't know how to communicate with people growing up. So there was a lot of new things, a new language, a new country, a new religion. There was all these new things going on in my life. In high school, I remember this, um, this older gentleman. He was a little bit bigger, and he was wide, and he was bald, and he came up to me. He's like, hey, do you want to be my friend? I said, nope, right? And he kept wanting to invite me places. I'm like, dude, leave me alone, please, right? And he kept persisting, kept persisting. He's like, hey, man, I got to invite you to this thing called Young Life. And finally, I'm like, okay, this guy's not going to leave me alone, so I'm just going to go. And I remember hearing about Jesus in a way I've never heard it before. I remember hearing that Jesus loved me, Jesus died for me, all these wonderful things, but... You know, I grew up all my life mostly here in in, in Texas, or I grew up in Texas in the United States, where every single day I woke woke up in the morning, I said the Pledge of Allegiance, I did everything I could, my parents told me I needed to be more white, I needed to be more successful, I did everything, paid my taxes, never got in trouble, I did everything I could, and then I, I was told that I was an alien, right? The, the term that I had was an authorized alien here in the United States. And I just told myself, I don't know if God loves me. Maybe God loves every other person, but not the alien. And that was one of the things that I struggled with. I got recruited to play football at Dort, and it was a Christian college, so I'm like, hey, maybe I can be, feel love finally, right, if I go, if I go uh, to this school. But I struggled. I went into an environment where I felt a lot of expectations. I felt that I needed to live up to this certain image where I felt like no one here struggled. People sat up a little straighter. People smiled a little bit more. And I was like, man, I can't tell people about my problems. They they would freak out. Um, I was ashamed by my culture. I remember my grandpa, before he passed away, he gave me a sombrero right? And I took it with me to college, even though I've never wore it before. I'm, I'm like, maybe one day I'm going to put this sombrero on, right? But I put it in my closet, never put it on. But there was this event at door. It was called Fiesta, right? Where we're supposed to celebrate Hispanic culture, right? And I'm like, okay, this is awesome. So I put my sombrero on, I walk, and some of my friends are like, what are you wearing? I'm like, it's called a sombrero. And they're like, that's not you. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe it's not me. Right? And I remember feeling this shame that I, you know, I keep hearing on one side that I'm loved, and then on the other side, I feel like I am, am that outsider that Jason is talking about. But I remember um, just people walking alongside me, people like Jason that, re- that talked about the Word of God and talked about places in the Word of God that would explain to me that I'm not an alien and that I'm not an outsider. It's Ephesians uh, 12, where it says the following, that this helped me so much. It's actually Ephesians 2, 12, and it says, Remember that you one time were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once was far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When this was told to me, it started finally making sense, and it started reminding me of what that, that um, guy from, from Young Life told me about. 
all these people who walked alongside me were now reminded, now it was coming together. It was like a puzzle. It's like, oh, I heard it from that person. I heard it from that person. I heard it from that person. I saw Christ and all three of those people that walked alongside me made a difference in my life. It was, it was people like Jason and people like Michael Cohn, who was my Young Life leader, that showed me ways that and it, and it allowed me to experience Christ in a way that I've never experienced before. I think because of those people who walked alongside me, I was able to discover my calling. I, I believe God has asked me to be a bridge. To be a bridge between the chasm, between cultural barriers. Be the, the bridge be, between people who are having problems denominationally. And people who are, have a, such an age gap, there's this chasm, the same way that there's this chasm between humanity and Christ. Jesus came and tried to uh, seal that, create a bridge so that people can come, up, uh, come through and come back. I believe Jesus Christ has given me a calling to be a bridge, to teach other, one, other people how to be a bridge as well. You see, the problem is, is that when we say, okay, let's just get a Hispanic person to do it. Let's just bring one person to do it. I believe it's all of our callings to do this. I believe in Young Life, we have a, a saying, you have to earn the right to be heard. In Young Life, we have countless people who have dedicated their time to volunteer to go into the school and not beat kids aside of the head with this, right? But to experience and do life with. Not to do ministry to, but to do ministry with. It's saying, hey, regardless of what you believe, regardless of our differences, regardless of who you are, I want to be your friend and make a difference in your life. Regardless if you don't think I'm cool or not. You see, my young life leader walked around the cafeteria with a garbage can, and he used his belly as a backboard, right? He would always say, hey, right here, right here. And I would just think, and I'm like, how could you do that? But now I find myself in that same situation. It was last year where I walked into the cafeteria where I'm getting really confident. Kids are starting to love me. And I went to the senior table. I sat down with all the guys. They all looked at each other, and they got up and walked away. And my heart hurt. And I said, what? Do they not think I'm cool enough? Do they not think? And all these things started coming back to me and I remember I'm like my identity doesn't come from people's approval my identity comes from Christ and they're not rejecting me they're rejecting Jesus when are we too good to receive prayer when are we too good to accept and welcome others right so guys I want to challenge you guys maybe God is calling putting something in your heart to be a person to walk alongside others to find someone like myself that is struggling Every day, I have the privilege to walk into the schools and find kids that remind me of myself. Kids who are ashamed of who they are. Kids who feel like they're too far away. Kids who think they're too cool. That was me. I was so ashamed of who I was that I told people I didn't speak Spanish when I came here to Northwest Iowa. My parents told me, are you sure you want to go there? This is the most red county in the United States, right? Because when you grow up Hispanic, they tell you the Republicans are the worst people ever, right? But that's, that's what I grew up with, the, the fears of these things, all these misconceptions, all these things that I didn't know about. But everyone here has the, the ability to change these misconceptions by showing the love of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray with me, and then Jason's going to come back, but... I'm going to pray in English and Spanish. So if you want to bow your heads, please. <clears throat> Padre nuestro, gracias por darme esta oportunidad de hablar en frente de la iglesia aquí. Te damos gracias por la oportunidad de escuchar tu voz, Señor. Te damos gracias por las personas que uh, demuestran el amor de ti a través de sus acciones, Señor. Te damos gracias por las personas que uh, están arrepentidas, Señor, por ser personas que unas veces no entendemos. Señor, te pido que estés con nosotros a través de estos tiempos, Señor. Te pido que uh, puedas poner algo en el corazón de las personas aquí para poder buscar a alguien como yo cuando yo estaba en la escuela, Señor. Lord, I ask you to please um, soften people's hearts, Lord. 
I ask you, Lord, to walk alongside them, Lord, the same way you're asking them to walk alongside others, Lord, so that they're able to find the person that is so desperately needing to hear you, Lord, so we can find the person who desperately needs to find and hear the gospel presented in a new way, Lord, because sometimes, Lord, we, 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 we go far away from what you are. We work so hard in our lives. We, we work so hard to, to seek protection, to seek uh, love, to seek all these things that some, sometimes, Lord, we look up and you're so far away, Lord. So I just pray that you, um, you re- come to where we are, Lord. Show us what you're calling us to do, Lord, and, and we give you thanks and glory, Lord. And we ask you these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Alex. I can still remember when I had Alex in class, he would sit there. There were some other students, too. Uh, I think for the first first half of the semester, at least, you thought I was crazy. Is that fair? Yeah. Maybe you still think that. Um, Anyway, thank you for sharing. At this time, let's come to our God uh, in prayer, and we will uh, end our prayer with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks and praise for this day that you have given us. We give you thanks and praise that you have called us to gather here in this place and in this space, to hear the word that you proclaim to us, to hear the word that shatters all of the things that divide us, to hear the word that shatters all of the ways in which we distinguish ourselves from others, we separate ourselves. Father, we are so grateful to hear in the book of Acts the Spirit that is sent from you to breathe life into us. Father, breathe that life into us and may we go from this place to testify to this good news. May we enter into the nooks and crannies of this world, of our communities. May we reach out to those who are on the margins. Father, may we love as you have loved us. Father, as we look at this world, we give you thanks and praise for the blessings that you give us, for the sun that rises, for the basic necessities, the food, the shelter that come from your hand each and every day. But Father, we also see that this world is not as it should be. Father, we pray that violence would cease, that wars would end. We pray that peace would come around the world. We pray for the people of Afghanistan and Syria for the people of Palestine and Israel. We pray for the people of Somalia and Sudan. Father, we pray for the people of Nigeria and for the countries of Latin America and South America. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come. We pray for those who are proclaiming the good news of the Gospels in these areas. And we pray, Father, that we might be open to hear about this peace and live lives of peace and grace and mercy. Father, we pray for our own communities. We pray for the divisions and and the violence and the hatred that are present even here in Northwest Iowa. Father, we pray that, again, we might be instruments of your peace, that we might leave this place and become signs of your love and your grace. Father, you know our needs and you see all of the needs listed here. We lift them all up to you. We pray for the members of this community who are sick. We pray for the members of this community who struggle with depression and anxiety. Father, we pray for members of this community who have lost loved ones. We lift up to you the Kinzinger family this morning. Father, we pray for this church. We pray for its leadership. We pray for the pastors, for the elders, and the deacons for the Sunday school teachers. Father, we pray that this place would be an important place that testifies to the good news of your gospel. Father, this morning we lift up all of these things and we pray with the words that Jesus taught us to pray, together saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.